glucose. So those basalt lava flows that I was talking about that, that, that uh, came out of the ground over by Idaho and flowed across the state. And there are uh, more than 300 of these separate lava flows. Your question more specifically is about the columns themselves. If we just enlarge one of the lava flows, <coughs> so here's now just one lava flow that's flowing across. When it was formed, it was orange, it was liquid, it was like Hawaii. And as it started to sit there and cool, the surface cooled first. And on the surface, we formed cracks, like cracks in a drying mud puddle. So now I'm going to try another drawing that's looking down on the top of this lava flow. And we're going to get your stop sign shaped cracks. So let me try this again. You've been to a mud puddle after a rainstorm, and the mud is starting to dry, and it's starting to contract and shrink. And cracks are forming, and nature is pretty strange sometimes. The cracks in a dry mud puddle have a natural shape to them over and over, a repetitive pattern. We think that's what's happening on the surface of a cooling lava flow, these same kind of hexagonal shapes, cracks. And then as the interior of the flow starts to cool, those cracks start to propagate towards the middle of the flow like a big stop sign shaped cookie cutter going right down into the flow. So the simple answer is those columns are cooling cracks, but they have that well-defined shape uh, because of got what, established got, uh, what, what got established on the surface of the flow as it came down. So that's, bed, that's the bedrock part of our lecture, just the first part when we form those columns. Yes, sir. Tana. Yeah. Just a couple of miles from where you had the photo of the moraine. Being right. The farthest eastern extent of the glacial activity. Yes. Just south of there. What is the farthest western extent of the Columbia Basalt? Wow, great. Uh, let me repeat that. We're in the Tatum now, which is um, over by Thorpe. Let's try a map of that real quick. So here's Ellensburg. Here's the freeway heading towards uh, Cleallum. And here is our ridge. This is our moraine. And in case you didn't catch it before, this ridge, this moraine, is showing us where the ice flowed down from Snoqualmie Pass and ended right there by the Thorpe Fruit and Antique Barn. Now the question involves, and it's a good one, those basalt flows we're talking about are actually coming from the other direction. So this is an interesting geology situation. Here we are in our little valley, and we've got stuff coming in from all directions. We've got glaciers coming down from Snoqualmie, and long before that, we had lava flows coming from the east, coming from Idaho. The question is, how far east did these lava flows get? This is uh, basalt lava. I got an answer. I'm not stalling. I got an answer. <laughs> Lookout Mountain has a well-defined northern or northwestern edge to it. Table Mountain and Lion Rock, north of Ellensburg, a well-defined north edge. If you look at that on a map, they work together. That's the edge of those Columbia River basalt flows. The basalt is extended all the way from Idaho to Lookout Mountain and no further to the west. And to the north, Table Mountain. And then you get north of Table Mountain and you're out of the basalts and you into much older rock. You're talking in here and now I am going to get fuzzy with you. Like where Ele Elephant Head and those guys. Uh, yes, that's basalt. But we lose it that well-defined edge we lose because there's so much volcanic stuff coming out of the Cascades, which is younger, which has covered everything up, that we can't find that very well. If we go keep, continue south, uh, we've got Columbia River basalts at Kawichi Canyon. We've got Columbia River basalts, uh, you know, Toppenish Ridge. I mean, you can, you can continue to take these little outcrops and then try to extend the line, but it's, it's really tough to follow. 
So I had a great answer for you up here, but right in the area you wanted, my answer kind of sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, this is a question about these periodic silent earthquakes that are running through the Cascadia subduction. I'm an earthquake junkie. I guess you are. <laughs> anyway. Um, one of the, like, my question has to do with how far do those impact inland? If the Cascadia plate is sliding under the North American plate, do we get that out here, or is that strictly out of the ocean? A little of both. Gosh, uh, let's try to involve everybody with that one. <laughs> Boy. Sorry. It, no, it's a great topic. Speaking of current work and mysteries to be solved, that's a big one. All right. We didn't hear the question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, it's hard just to repeat the question. Okay, I'll try it though. Okay. There are recently discovered earthquakes that are bizarre. There are earthquakes that happen that we don't feel. Instruments pick them up, but we don't feel them. And the instruments that pick them up are these GPS receivers that are anchored in the ground. And that's what I'm trying to debate. The, the question is how far inland do those silent earthquakes, those slow, those, those quiet earthquakes reach? Let me do my best to answer that and involve everyone without ever explaining it in the lecture. But I can do it. I'm a public servant. I'm going to start sweating just a little bit, but other than that we're fine. Okay? Here's Washington. Here's Ellensburg. And I'm going to put a bunch of dots on the map. These are not cities. But these are these GPS receivers that are anchored into the bedrock. And actually the people that I work with at Central in the geology department are the leaders in processing this data. So we're actually pretty famous here in Humble Ellensburg with this part of geology. Now here's the cool, remember the clockwise rotation thing I was talking about? That's real. And so all these stations uh, up in this part of the state are moving to the northeast. These arrows are showing the uh, movement of these GPS stations, which means the crest itself is moving to the northeast very slowly but very steadily. Okay, that was not a surprise because we know about this rotation business, right? Here's the surprise. Every 14 months, there is a two-week window where every one of these damn receivers starts going the other way. <laughs> I'll say that again. These, all, all of the crust of western Washington generally is moving to the northwest a few millimeters a year. But every 14 months, like clockwork by the way, every 14 months there's a two week span where these guys all go about face and start heading to the southwest. And that was discovered in the late 1990s by some British Columbia guys. We're now adding to that knowledge, and it's not just up here, it's all through this clockwise rotation. Everybody, for, for a two-week window, goes back the other way, just a little bit. About face. The about face is this release of energy that we call these slow, unfelt earthquakes. And I can't get into all this because this is a very long discussion, but the reason these, <coughs> these big earthquakes are happening is because of the ocean floor diving beneath Washington. And we are now quite clear that these little about face two week times is a release of some of that energy. Uh, basically the energy of a magnitude seven earthquake which can kill people, magnitude 7. Instead of it happening at the snap of a finger, it's that same energy released over two weeks. That's why we don't feel it. And again, we've picked it up here, and there's other signatures of it as well. So finally, to answer your question, that about face signature uh, gets dampened as you move east. And so we have a GPS station on top of my building, Lind Hall, and it barely is registering anything, whether the northeast or the southwest. Um, as you get to Cleallum, a little bit more. So it's a gradual ascent. So we're kind of out of the slow earthquake 
area as we understand it now, although there's debate about that. Couple more. Yes. What's the source of the Lahar out on Highway 10 along the river? Uh, I love the question. <laughs> what is the source of the Lahars out by Thorpe on the old road? I showed you those photos of the three Lahars that are up there. And I made the point that it's not sandstone. It's from a volcano. 10 million year old deposits, which means volcanoes that are no longer standing. Here's another concept for you. Rainier hasn't always been there. Volcanoes like Rainier have about a 2 million year age span, and then they die. We don't know why. So these cones that we know as the Cascade Volcanoes have a birth, adolescence, grow nice and tall, and then finally expire after 2 million years. So there was a volcano 10 million years ago that erupted multiple times, made our lahars, and then has completely eroded away, but we still have ways to find them where that volcano used to be. Here's my answer. Yeah. Ellensburg. Here's our ridges. Yakima. Here's our, here's Thorpe. So we're trying to explain the, the volcanic mud flows at Thorpe, and we're trying to figure out where that ancient volcano was. I'll just cut to the chase. Here's Bumping Lake. On the way up to Chinook and White Pass. X marks the spot. Wow. We've spent 20 years looking for more deposits like we have out at Thorpe that has the right age and the right chemistry, and we found some at the base of Menashtash, and there's a guy who's done a lot of mapping. <coughs> um, Natchez area, uh, Mount Aix, if you happen to know it, the Goat Rocks, that country all down here, just to the east of the Cascade Crest. And the volcano obviously is gone, but we can visualize a Mount Rainier-like volcano standing near Bumpin' Lake that erupted and had mud flows flowing through a river valley that headed right through Thorpe. Now you go, well, wait a minute, I know there's no river today doing that. This is before the ridges. This is before we compress the bedrock layers to make our ridges that we know. You can't do a, ridge, a river today from Bumping Lake to Thorpe. We got ridges in the way. But this is back before that, when we had a gradual river system. About what year? About how many years? About, about 10 million years ago. Mm -hmm. 10 million years ago. Before these ridges really got established. So you're doing ge geologic forensics. That's a good way to say it. We're doing geologic forensics. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a more modern way of saying it. My old analogy is like we're detectives. We've got a bunch of clues laying around. Not many clues, by the way. Most of the clues are gone. Just little fragments of things here and there. Look at this. We've got fragments of mud flows here, here, here. And yet we have to reconstruct this whole thing. And to me, that's fun. And that's why a lot of us go into this line of work. It's not just identifying rocks and little boxes in a laboratory. <laughs> that's pretty boring. It's this that's kind of fun. And there's plenty of mystery still out there. Yes? There, what looks to me like one of those uh, Lahars, it's six, at Mapo 6 up the Tianway. Mapo 6 up the Tianway. Um, that's, that's possible. Mile post six up the Tianaway, so we're, we're, we're north now of our picture right here. And that is good Swak sandstone country, and it is tough to distinguish between sandstones and these lahars. So the way to do it would be to get out there and look for these pumice rocks and these other very strange rocks that are encompassed within this kind of sandy matrix. But 